This, this is the OGM call for June 16th, 2022. Uh, turn on the transcript as well. There we go. We are on the rhythm where this week we have a topic to choose. Uh, we have a couple in the air, as you see from the email I sent around. Uh, Doug, if you'd like to explain what you were thinking uh, last week when it smelled like a topic, uh, sorry, two weeks ago, when it smelled like a topic for this call, uh, that would be a great place to begin. Sure. Um, the, the, the one qualification I'll make at the top is that um, what I'm, what I'm going to be speaking to is not a thing. So um, we're, we're, you know, our world runs on nouns and objectification. And um, this is really uh, sort of not that, <laughs> if that's conceivable. It's entirely uh, conceivable. <laughs> so um, I, I've basically been immersed for the last five years in um, hu human generativity, like how do we co-create together? And um, got to that question on the basis that um, all the stuff we see out the window that, that um, everybody here has spoken to the need for change of, or transformation of, or replacement of, or, um, or healing, or fixing, or curing. Um, all of that was created by us. And so maybe if I looked at how we create as a species on a fundamentals basis, um, then that would be a good starting place and service to figuring out how we can do that differently. Like how we can change the way we actually relate to each other and relate to co-creating. Um, because if we continue to do what we've always done and you know all the quotes, right? We're, we're gonna continue to generate what we've been generating. So um, what that ended up surfacing was the idea that before everybody tends to start with what the it is that we're working on. And what came out of a lot of conversation with a couple of people was that that's sort of chapter three or four in the creative process. It's not the beginning of the story. And that before you get to the it, the ingredients to make whatever soup is gonna be made, um, the first thing is if, are, are you and I aligned on a values level? Like the way we wanna to relate to each other in co-creating, the way we want our creation to um, come into manifestation. And on a values level, from a starting place and alignment standpoint, and, and by the way, uh, this doesn't head into Richard Barrett territory. So um, it's not about voluminous lists of infinite slices and shades of variations on, on value, like it's not an objectification of values. It's, you know, um, like, what are the internalized, embodied, felt, sense, held, energetic orientations to how we do us, how I do me, how I relate to others, um, and how I would have them relate to me, sort of the golden, golden rule level values stuff. Um, and so that was sort of one bookmark. Um, and a process of delanguaging, unlearning, cleaning slate. Um, it took 18 months to get to that. Um, as a, like that first ingredient. And then, um, 
On the other end of the generative uh, frame, it's on a purpose level, what's the it that we're creating in service to who? Like what's the value contribution in service to who and, and for what reason? And the inquiry being, are we also aligned on that? Which actually came up as a question in the previous two sessions. Like what's the it? And the, the current paradigm prevailing pattern is competitive. So it's like a bloody red ocean feeding frenzy of who's it wins. Can I convince all of you to get on board with my it? And, um, and if the it isn't addressed at the top and alignment and agreement sort of that everybody's on board with why they're here and what they're doing, working in service to, um, then uh, the feeding frenzy thing happens and nothing gets manifested. So that was five years in, in a group. Um, started at two hours a week, evolved into four two-hour sessions, eight hours a week. Um, unable to produce anything because of competition of who wins. So if you get as far as a values alignment and you're able to sort of get arms around a purpose for why a group of people have come together to co-create. So where does the creation happen? Like if you really unpack and strip things down, like how do things come into manifestation? And so that is a phenomena of the present moment. Like this meeting is currently being in fact co-created moment to moment by all of the people that are present here now. Like that's the moment of manifestation. And the concept of working from nothing or working from a blank, a true blank slate isn't as much about um, knowledge or subject matter or practice or technique or solution development or whatever. It's about what is the orientation and mindset on a presency basis of the people that are co-creating together. And if everybody comes packing everything in their individual rear view mirrors, that is a direct hit to being in the present moment as a contributing co-creator because it takes energy and attention to carry all that stuff and hold it. So am I thinking about my pet construct of salvation for the world right now, this minute here, or am I present and in the moment looking, listening, taking in processing and, and, uh, and receiving what's in the field. So that has to do with the rear view mirror being brought in. The other sort of favorite dynamic of current paradigm is um, projecting into the future. Like the God of, um, I'm gonna project into the future as if I actually have the ability <laughs> to um, uh, make reality conform to converge with and meet my projection. The fundamental greatest single most delusionary like construct of mankind. Like the fact that we have a brain and can do that doesn't mean like that it actually helps. 
best laid plans of mice and men nine out of ten times um reality when you get to that projected future point bears no resemblance to the reality that was projected so that sort of seems like a a fool's errand if you keep doing that you never end up confronting the actual picture you envision manifesting or creating so present moment blank slate empty starting from empty whatever the it is um is really the idea of letting go of your rear view mirror your baggage your stuff leaving that at the door letting go of the orientation that says we have to project, we have to create a target, we have to create an output, we have to create a noun fixed thing on the back end um, up front. If you eliminate bringing the past in, if you eliminate bringing projection, need for projection in, and you settle into the idea of present moment, the operating question becomes from a complete present moment place, what's needed? Now, now if you have the values thing locked and you have the shared purpose defined, and that's not books and volumes, that's like literally a really simple, short, sweet statement then with those two things referenced and everybody oriented based on those, what's needed now? And that's the beginning. Like that's, that's the generative moment, blank slate like inquiry. And, um, and working from emergence, uh, feeling into sensing into and, and, and manifesting from there. And, and that's really it. I'm sorry for the length of that, but that's sort of the, the gestalt anyway. That's a great intro. Um, and I think it got a lot of us provoked in a bunch of different ways, which I would like to tap into right now. So who would like to um, jump in? I'd like to ask Doug if you can put that into a simple question. And now with all that background and context, can you just ask a simple question that would get us all thinking about how to engage with your point? Um, well, the, the first question is, um, because this is, I usually never get past the first question, which is everybody down with leaving their baggage at the door. <laughs> and and you know what the answer universally has always been at least one out of n number of people has always been somebody who after a lot of back and forth and tussle ultimately says no i'm not <laughs> and it's sort of better to clear that at the front end and go okay i guess we're not doing this um, than it is to spend, you know, five years and, and um, a lot of time and effort getting to the fact that you're not going to be able to transcend um, on a collective basis, transcend each person's individual attachments. So what would be the next question for the purposes of this? <laughs> <laughs> so hypothetically, if everybody said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And by the way, it, it provokes all sorts of stuff internally for people. So it's only for whatever a period, you know, like 90 minutes, like you can have it all back at the end. It's not forever. It's not banishing or invalidating it. It's not judging it. It's not saying thou shalt not or any of that. Like, um, so if everybody were game to do that, then the next question would be, um, what's, what is the, an expression of collective purpose? Why are we each individually here in service to? What's the, what's the, the driver? What's the, the, 
the energetic um, the energetic reason that that gets me up in the morning that is bigger than me is not about my self-interest and not about my my identity about me in service to uh, the the larger we if you would the larger context and species planet biome and the rest of it and is is that a statement that we could evolve a uh, couple of sentences that everybody would be like yeah I'm, I'm down with that. This reminds me of a story from my own life. When I was in the fourth grade, I got the idea that unicorns were the coolest thing in the world. And I drew pictures of unicorns on cards. And before the school started, I put one on every desk uh, in my class. And I watched people come in thinking they were going to get it. <laughs> Did that not and happen? Nobody <laughs> got it. And I was crushed. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, can, can you leave I... that baggage at the door, Doug? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> leave the unicorns outside the door. Uh, Kevin, then me. Yeah. Um, Doug, I just want to be clear, like, one person can cancel the field trip for everybody, right? And that's what you're saying. If one person said, wow, um, that seems really pretty stupid. And there's a, there's a reason for that. Because, and, and complete projection on my part, it's my belief, but, but it's mine. Um, which is that like, it's all of us or none of us. Like whatever so the you're solution, letting the recalcitrant stop whatever any the, collective. Well, so you're letting the recalcitrant stop any collective action. Well, I mean, from from you, a, you from should, a, you should from, hire out to businesses to encrust their bureaucracies. Uh, that's kind of <laughs> what they're already doing. Well, from a practical standpoint, isn't that sort of like the reality? Like no, if if if, disagree. if some are not disagree. if some aren't on board, then you're sort of doomed. Um, you're asking for a hundred percent consensus. I mean, there was a little bit on the list about definitions of consensus. You're sort of requiring that everybody agree. There's. Uh, it I sounds. Would, it sounds like that's what you're doing. There's a little bit of a difference. The difference is that the the consensus idea is about agreement to the it, agreement to um, concrete, like consensus comes up in that governance mean territory, in that decision-making mean territory. And I'm not, I'm not all of us or none of us in a projective way, in, in that projective way. I'm more coming at it from a reductionist orientation of um, if even within this number of people in this moment of time, it is impossible for everybody on an internalized, embodied, fully sensed, fully felt, fully conceived basis to go, yeah, like, I resonate and I'm in alignment with that. Then um, I, you know, I don't think it bodes well for the prognosis. So I'm starting with the beginning of, is that idea possible? Like, can we even get that far? Um, Kevin, are you done with what you were saying? Um, you know, I just think you're, you're, you're setting up a protocol that could metastasize and replicate Joe Manchin in every, in every uh, clutch point. I think it's a, a really disastrous idea. What's the alternative, Kevin? Well, you know, that sometimes minority voices are not right. There has to be a, you know, you can't let one recalcitrant stop collective action on climate change in your community because they don't want to build a rain garden. We're building rain gardens in Black Mountain. Uh, you know, you can't 
let one person who's against the good things stop what most everybody wants. I mean, you know, this is like, you know, give the, give the Grinch the golden chair. It just seems incredibly bad to me. I mean, that's, I'm just, that's just, I may not be seeing what you're picturing, but that's what, how I can imagine it. So let's, let's find our way to what Doug means. Let me go for a second and then pass the floor to Wendy. Um, a couple of things I wanted to say. One is, um, I think you're asking us to be extremely present and to let go of things that might keep us from being present and to ask what is really needed in the moment. And you could have started with that and I would have been like, I'm cool with that. But you've gone a bunch of places that are really complicated for a bunch of us. And I think I have an instinct. You're talking to a crowd that's way down the road you're talking about, but you're talking about to us as if we're not. Like, oh, I know you're not going to come this way and so forth. And, I, and I'm resisting that. So I'm finding myself fighting that a little bit. Um, one of my beliefs is that you've got to know how the sausage was made and you have to have some ideas about what the future is going to be. And then you have to let go of them to come back into beginner's mind and be present. But that, but to me, the reason we're as fucked up as we are is that a bunch of clever people out in the world had plans for the future and successfully drove them through society in ways that are extremely dysfunctional that we don't know how to neutralize. And so the idea that that working on the future and having a plan for the future is, is useless doesn't, doesn't engage in my head. But again, I can drop plans and I can be present. And I, like, I, I think I'm reasonably skilled at, at, at just being present and responding to what's happening you know, in the moment. Um, second thing is, if you're trying to get everybody to agree on a thing, which seems to be an important part of the process you're recommending, how do you avoid that thing from becoming like motherhood and apple pie statements? Like, we're just looking out for the betterment of humanity, or uh, for if, if humanity is a virus on the planet, the, the betterment of the planet. And, and like, I think many people could agree to that, but boy, it's a watered down statement that doesn't mean a lot, doesn't mean anything. Maybe what you're suggesting is a process for helping people decide to opt out of a group. Like, oh, this group seems to be really interested in designing better subways for the world. And I'm subways are just not my thing. So I'm going to leave, I'm going to exit now and go find a group that whose purpose is more centered on what I'm interested in. That's interesting in some way. And then at some point I wanted to pass the, the floor to Stacy because she has spent many, many hours in a group called GCC, which I think a couple other people have been involved in, which feels to me like it's coming at things in very much this way. And I'm unclear has has like like what's happened there. I would love kind of a, a check-in in some sense on that. So these are some of the complexities that Doug, that you've popped in my head. Uh, and if you'd like to reply to those, go ahead and then I'll pass to Wendy or I'll go straight to Wendy. Um, I, my, there, there's zero projection that I'm attached. I have no attachments in relation to what I'm speaking to. Um, and there's no projections on anybody else in terms of a state of being or a level of consciousness or awareness or present moment, not present or any of that. Um, I, I, don't, um, I don't bring any of that or but intend, your statements intend didn't to sound express like that. any of that. Your, your statements didn't sound that way. You said things like in any group, somebody always object and that's projecting onto us that we're just gonna barf on the idea. I mean, like, it felt like you had some assumptions about what was going on. Yeah, I, nothing projective. I mean, that those statements were just from past experience that, that um, there's always been a lot of triggerings and a lot of things um, experienced as, in, as part of what I've, I've expressed that I didn't say. <laughs> so the, the um, I, I'll leave it there, but I, I um, for my experience, uh, transcending all of the reflexive stuff and shedding all of the attachments were no easy feat. Like it was a huge uh, work, amount of work to get above those things, to get past them. Uh, Buddhism apparently takes many years. Yeah, I mean, it, it's so a non-trivial exercise. Yeah. Totally agree. 
Um, Wendy, then Pete. Yeah, a couple, I just want to, before I comment, I just wanted to speak to the comments in the chat that are saying, what are we talking about? And I'm disoriented. And so I don't, I, I'm happy that I want to contribute something and add on to it before I do that. Maybe someone could, maybe Jerry or Doug, you could just try to encapsulate where this began, for, especially for those who came in as you were speaking and didn't catch the very beginnings. Oh, I thought you were going to do the summarizing. Darn it. Um, who, who would <laughs> you like... want me to, I will. Yeah. You want me um, to take a stab at it? I'm happy to. If you'll take a stab, that'd be great. Sure. Um, I'm going to say it in a completely different way in hopes that that actually really helps add to what we're talking about. Um, many of the systems that we currently have are broken, if not all of them. And, and I'm talking about the systems, not the people necessarily, right? So as we approach this next wave of humanity, we need a new way to go about solving problems. I think everybody in this room probably is on board with that piece. What I hear Doug talking about is how do we go about doing that? And for those of us that, are, that have walked a path of feeling like we're getting close to doing it differently, we have noticed that there are trip ups, right? That, that pull us back into the old systems, that pull us back into the old ways of thinking and that pull us back into the old core beliefs that we all come in with. And Doug was pointing out from what I got and what I and I agree that um, we come in with agendas. Those can look like so many different things. This can look like what we learned as a child, what we believe in, the myths that we absorbed, um, the culture of a co company, um, what we hope for our future, what we hope for our children, how much money we have or don't have, like all these things become triggers. And in the moment of a conversation where something is trying to be co-created that is bigger than each one of us alone, when we get triggered, we tend to pull on the thread of that new thing and pull it back into our own story and then voice it from the perspective of our own story, thus derailing the conversation from where it was going to where we need it to go in that moment. And so we anchor it back down into whatever, whatever baggage. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's a, that's a process I think we all do all the time. It's how we learn. But if we can't be in spaces where we are where we can stay for long enough outside our own agenda to discover what that thing is that we're trying to co-create, well, it'll never, it'll never happen. Not never, but like it, then it comes in in tiny little pieces we can barely grab onto instead of something fully formed. So the conversations that are most valuable to me are the, and I've experienced this personally, I've had the experience of these kinds of conversations over and over again, is when the people in the room can put it aside for the entirety of the conversation are now most curious about the thing that can emerge. So I may be adding in something from my own experience, totally fine. I may even go on a small little tangent, but it's all the time thinking about how can I add to what's being said? How can I contribute on to listening so deeply to what's being contributed by other people and then trying to add one more thing that helps grow it forward instead of drawing it back. And the, and the feeling of that is almost more important. The process of that is because inside of that process, anything can be said and the conversation can go anywhere. And if something tr triggered someone, bringing that in can even be an important piece. The goal of everyone is moving the conversation forward and not getting so triggered that the conversation becomes about solely about them or solely dragged down by their baggage. So that's that's the summary <laughs> I would give it. Thanks for um, taking and, a swing at that, that's awesome. Yeah, and assuming that helped, I'll just add on what I was gonna say before. Um, I think uh, that one of the major shifts for me and most of the conversations that I've had around trying to create space for this is an understanding that what we're doing is Again, I think Doug touched on it and I just kind of want to come at it from a slightly different angle is that we're not, we're not trying to create a thing, right? We're not trying to, we're not, 
We're not trying to reach a particular goal. It doesn't mean we can't have a goal in mind, but we, we need to not be attached to that goal because what happens so often is the conversational lead say halfway there. And I'm talking about conversation over months or even in one, I suppose, lead halfway there. And because you've gotten halfway there, you can now see more. And all of a sudden you take a right-hand turn. And if you can't let go of the original goal, you'll never take the right-hand turn that was intended for you all along. And I think most of us have that experience in life. We can look back at moments where like, we went halfway down this path, worked for this place, it was horrible. But then from there, I got to the thing that I loved, right? So sometimes we're, we're drawn towards something that is the end point is not the goal. The path to it is the goal. And then we turn or we, right? And we need to be able to be flexible in that way. So what we're committing to isn't the goal. What we're committing to is the process. It's a way of being with each other and it's the process. And we haven't, as humans, I believe, haven't talked about the process very much. So it doesn't give us a lot of language, but it, I can tell you it's a lot of verbs and it's a lot of sense-making and it's a lot of vibe and it's, and there are people who have documented it. And my experience of the best version of that, and I'm sure there are others, is the Winfinity framework, because that's what, that's what they've been worked. That's exactly what they're doing. The framework is not a thing. It's a process that everyone's going on committing to this, practicing this process. And it's one of the few spaces that, um, that I know of where people can actually practice it together. And one of the one of the quali qualifications is kind of a wrong word, but one of the preambles to being a part of, of the Winfinity Inquiry Cluster is that you need to be able to leave your baggage at the door. <laughs> so I think, um, um, yeah, I think that co covers it. Thanks for letting me talk for so long. Hope that was helpful. Thanks, Wendy. Mm -hmm. Totally was. Um, Pete. Um, thanks, Doug. Thanks, Wendy. Um, uh, I'm not sure I'm completely contextualized, so I'm not sure if this, <laughs> if if what I'm thinking, adds or or isn't is maybe part of a, a different conversation. But I feel like, Doug, what you're talking about is are are groups of people working together, who are each fairly self-actualized, maybe not completely, but reasonably so, and. And so they have a lot of reflexiveness about their participation in a group. And, um, and certainly the, the folks here and the folks each of us tends to work with are going to be folks like that. But I, I also want to observe um, as a amateur sociologist or anthropologist or something like that, and I am completely an amateur at it, but um but everybody has to do it uh, to this some some extent um i think a lot of human activity uh and psychology and stuff like that um is at a at a somewhat more um human animal um perspective than you know human homo rational rationalic or something like that um many people and even you know even me and probably some of you um make decisions not based on you know how mission aligned is uh my engagement with these other folks um and um and for me i think what what you talk through um i've i've certainly seen in my life where um, if you if you don't talk about how you're going to work together when the going gets tough, especially when you have a challenge, when when you need to change direction, or when there's an external force that that pushes really hard on the group, you know what's going to happen. So in my life, that's being married and being in a startup, which are kind of similar, actually, in an odd way. But a, a good marriage that's going to last decades um, is is one where you've had the a tough a bunch of tough conversations at the beginning um, you know so 
So what happens if I get hit by a bus and I'm a vegetable? You know, are you going to be with me or not? What happens, you know, if I go senile and I'm like 1% there, uh, are you still going to love the 1% while you have to deal with 99% of bullshit, you know, or whatever, right? Startups is kind of the same thing, right? Um, it feels easy to go, hey, let's build this product that would do wonders for the world. Um, and, and you find yourself a year or two later or three years later you know, okay, we've run out of funding um, and we've been going on fumes for six months and we can deliver the product in another six or 12 months, but we're going to be running on fumes the rest of it. Um, you know, I I was willing to mortgage my house, weren't you? <laughs> you know, what what do you mean that, y- you know, you're tired of this and you want to you go home and, and stop playing ball? I need you to, to finish the product. And I thought we were in it together, right? And even more, I, I've been in more stressful. Um, that's that's an easy stressful situation compared to some of the ones that I've been in in a startup, right? Um, uh, a, a time we were in a startup, we hired in a couple young kids who ended up deciding that they were going to overthrow the company and take take over the company, right? Um, smart Stanford kids, by the way, and it's a whole interesting story. But anyway, it literally got to the point where they were like carting out servers and IP and stuff like that. And we were sleeping in front of the door and the police were involved and, you know, threats of lawsuits and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, you look at your partner and you go, are you still, are you still with me? <laughs> or is this where, you know, we didn't have the discussions, the deep discussions to self-actualize together to to make it right but but there's a different way that that people work in on mass which is i'm i'm going to join your group i'm going to follow your leadership as long as you kind of make me feel self-actualized fulfilled even though i'm not necessarily self-actualized or fulfilled um uh so cults especially um some of the ways that people are are religions together it's not necessarily because they believe the mission alignment it's because that hey we get to all be in a cult together and i get my human animal needs fulfilled just by the fact that we're together and leader says okay the mission is blah 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 and i don't i think that's kind of crazy but hey I can be in community with you and we can be in community together and we are following a way that that makes me feel complete, right? Um, it's kind of like a, a replacement for self-actualization. You know, I don't know how to self-actualize, but if I'm at least feeling good about where I am, even if I don't really believe in the mission, I feel good, you know, and that's good enough for for many people and many social situations and many interactions, right? Um, so I, I just want to, I, I guess the, the, the summary of what I wanted to say is that, yeah, there are situations and people who are going to try to do something difficult and, and if they have the, the, the difficult conversations about how we're going to do that together up front, they're likely to stay together through difficult times. Um, but then there are like big chunks of our lives where it's not there's a it, it's a two level thing where the the mission alignment is one thing and the community and community involvement and the the needs and desires i have to be you know a a participating uh, human in a community are actually solved not at all in relationship to the mission it's just in relationship to how can I keep this many people together um, uh, and, you know, either do something positive or do something negative, you know, um, and the, the cult leader might might be doing it for the good of, of a mission and they might be doing it just to, to fleece somebody and make billions of dollars or, you know, or whatever, right? So just, just a, a way of, of, kind of i guess putting that that the whole conversation about that in in maybe a larger conversation where why do we do what we do why do we get together and do things um and is it always about accomplishing something or is it just i just need to be a human with other humans thanks thanks pete 
Mr. Carranza. Um, thanks. Um, thanks, Pete and Wendy and um, all the participants. Um, Doug, I say this with love. When I dropped into the conversation, I'm kind of going, what is this wishy-washy new age double talk? I'm like, what's going on here? I, I don't, um, uh, man, yeah, man, I basically, I put on my relentlessly accepting um, listen thing and uh, type in what you're saying and uh, just listen. And hmm, it brings up the training I'm going through for healing from trauma. Uh, it's called traumatic incident reduction. And a woman uh, with a foundation in South Africa who basically tries to do this work among boys from the Congo who've been kidnapped and forced into um, fighting um, for something they don't believe in. And they escape and boy, they have trauma worse than mine. And the training has gone on interminably. And yes, we're training how to listen and we're training how to create a safe space so that someone can process through language, the feelings from the amygdala, get them into the frontal cortex and move them to the um, hippocampus. And so be released from wordless anxiety. Great. People have dropped out because the training took too long. I don't believe that a Bohmian conversation or the consensus process or nonviolent communication can be achieved without a training step. And Doug Engelbart and his famous HLAMT, you know, humans with, with technology under training. And so this commitment to a kind of, of, yes, we share a context, that context is in development. We're not out of the same place. We're gonna get triggered and we're going to deal with these things as they come up because of commitment to something that's like a cult, but isn't a cult. And it's a both and human and rational, human animal. I love that uh, notion, Pete, and, and rational animal um, thing. And the paradox that I have coming from work um, at the Internet Archive is, you know, I was trying to get Ken Homer in to basically say, look, let's have some training on how to communicate, how to have conversations about goals. And um, one guy says, hey, we don't need that. We're great. We don't have any problems here. <laughs> so there's, there's your one guy. Um, and that's fine. And he derailed the process. And, uh, you know, other people were not able to engage in conflict with him because they didn't have the training. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't know about a lot of the language that you used, but conflict exists. And boy, do we have tools and training that we weren't given by our community, our schools, our parents. And I'm calling it in my own head, a paradox of training. How do we basically say, I know that I'm not perfect in my communication and in my listening in, in these aspects. I am taking a particular training right now um, to heal other people's trauma. And I have to, as a listener, and I have to trust that these other people are taking their training seriously so that I might heal. And God damn it, I want to heal. And it hasn't happened since January. And I'm kind of frustrated here. Well, um, it might not even be the right uh, training because I'm finding that uh, CPTSD is more my, uh, seems to be more than, you know, the trauma um, that, say, a, a boy in the Congo had. Um, 
And I don't know how to, you know, the thing that got everybody in training, in my experience, was the consensus process of the Rainbow Coalition. And they had, you know, to basically protest the Yellow Canyon and many affinity groups they were trained how to create an affinity group, how to train in the consensus process, how to pick somebody to represent the affinity group in a larger group and of that larger group, get a representative to get to the national group. And, you know, it was a 35 page pamphlet that got printed and sent to everybody who wanted to join the Abalone Alliance. Um, I, I, that's the only time I've ever seen that type of thing work. But certainly, you know, schools do training, schools do indoctrination, and maybe not hitting the other kid, um, not bullying. Sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't. Anyway, um, if there's a training and it's actually not going to take six months, <laughs> two hours a night, um, once a week, um, I'm interested in what that is. Certainly, Bohmian conversations have been mentioned many times by many people around the Engelbart group that's here in the Bay Area. Um, Wendy, or, or you know, comments are fine. Uh, Mark, thank you so much. I just want to uh, offer us a little moment of silence to sit with what you just brought into the room. Just uh, let's go quiet for a second, then we'll go, go to Wendy in a little bit. We can do a few deep breaths on our own. Wendy, please. Hmm. You know, there's so, um, so yeah, before I make my comment, I just want to say that what I was making an effort to do right there is sense into what was being said and leave a space in my mind and my heart for what would be the next best thing to contribute to the conversation, which may have been different than what I was, what I raised my hand for and allowing that shift to take place because of what Mark contributed. Um, yeah, I feel there's so there's, yeah, there's so much hurt. <laughs> there's so much um, suffering doesn't it, it comes in many forms, right? Little and big. We are there's no doubt this is not, you know, this is not philosophical. Um, and when I say we are in a mental health crisis and we have been for a long time. And I don't think it comes into mainstream conversation very often because it's complicated because people don't really know what to do about it because it's the result, it's a symptom of so many of the broken systems, right? And so it doesn't have just one solution. If it did, I think we would have solved it already. And I think we see it most clearly in our youth um, who are struggling with wanting to create a new world and seeing it more clearly than those of us who are older and have lived with the systems for longer and are more embedded in them and they're coming with fresh eyes and they're coming with fresh hearts and they're coming with fresh minds and fresh ears and they're going, what? 
and they don't always have the agency or the articulation or the understanding to create something new until we see like, you know, those voices of, of um, that, are, that are coming forward, that are popping out, whether it was about climate change or about gun legislation or whatever, that it just, they just gifted, I would say gifted genius type children that are genius around social acuity and, and emotional um, intelligence that are ready to take on that kind of lead, oh my gosh, at such a young age. Um, we need that times, you know, a million people. I do think we're out there. I think what we're talking about is the reason why facilitation is so important, why Ken Homer's work and Stacy's work and Doug's, I'm sure, like uh, anybody that's had, that's been in a position where they've had to create this kind of space or they've had to explain it to someone else or, you know, there's so many approaches and yet it still tends to be viewed as we, we've created such a, such a wall between science and spirituality that there's immediate judgment about spiritual things. And it's a shame because those two things, when we're talking about life, not talking about trying to understand something that we're seeing in front of, I mean, science has its, oh my God, it's done amazing things, but these two need to come back together in ways that our reasoning and our sensing come and in both have a place in informing where we're going next. It's not a one or the other, in my opinion. It's a both and, it's a merging of. It's not just the male energy or the female energy. We're asked, we're being asked to merge them. It's not just science or spirituality, we're being asked to merge them. It's not just academics, you know, ivory tower or main street. We're being asked to merge them. We're being asked to listen to all of it because it's only through listening to all of it that we're going to come up with the next thing that's going to work for all of it because <laughs> it needs to work for all of it because, and I think this is where Doug was going before when he was like, you know, it's either all or nothing. It's not that the room, the conversation in the room needs to be all or nothing, but eventually the solutions, how they ripple out need to be all or nothing because we won't get across the finish line unless we do it together. And those leading can be a certain set of people for sure, but we need to make sure it's not just 10 people that cross the line. Wendy, thank you. Um, I will point out that there's a business model behind what you just said. The Templeton Prize awards a million dollars to one person, I think annually, who contributes to the unification of science and spirituality. <clears throat> so. We could, we could roll the dice on that one. How about that? Um, and I'm not saying that at all that trivialize what you just said. I think that that, that work is really important. Um, and it's interesting that, that it's even rewarded somewhere. That's an, I, the fact that it's rewarded enhances it, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Templeton is the founder of the Templeton Fund, one of the original sort of mutual funds, one of the big ones. Uh, Stacy then Doug. So this is hard because it really goes against everything that we've just been saying. And I had my hand up before, and then I put it down because by the time we got to me, the energy had shifted and it wasn't the right time and place. But so I've spent almost four and a half years with Doug in that group, eight hours a week. And so I think I can do this because actually under Doug's leadership, he kind of empowered me to do my own thing and so i'm blending this new way of being by by making this decision to take this shift so what i want to say is the reason i now spend most of my time here is because the people in this group are at a different level so this conversation isn't necessarily like what they would need like they're they like it's a different group of people and so the reason I want to shift this conversation is I actually did have something that I wanted to bring up for this level of awareness that I think is important. And it, it is also a hard conversation. 
and I'm glad Wendy's here because I know she'll support me. <laughs> but it's um, a, a question that I had actually spoken to Jerry about, and we and the question was, how do we bake in diversity? Because if we had more diversity, some of these things that we're talking about would actually happen organically, um, just by getting things would naturally start happening differently. Um, and so I wanted to offer just a new a new term, and it's called intellectual chivalry. And it's the idea of opening the door is not enough. It's about allowing people to walk in first. And I was thinking about like David, uh, Dawn of Everything, and how the first person is the one you know. Like David Graeber's name was really familiar to me. David Wengro, not so much. And I was thinking of how many people have partners who are female and not too often do they mention their partners first in their work. And that's what I was coming in with. So I just want, I just wanted to throw that out because it seemed to me that, and maybe I was wrong, but it seemed in the beginning that some people were a little bit bothered by, um, I don't know, the level of conversation. Maybe I'm reading it wrong and maybe I'm being too blunt. I don't know. I wish um, I will stop talking, but that's it. And I, I think I'm going to start a new, a new group and it's going to be elephants and bulls because I want to discuss the elephants in the room and I'm sort of like a bull in a china shop sometimes. You could just open a china shop. <clears throat> There's going to be a lot of glass on the floor. <laughs> exactly, exactly. The shard factory. And then you could open a mosaic, like a mosaic studio next door. And it'll be beautiful artwork. Exactly, exactly. Um, a for-profit emergency room. <laughs> uh, perfect. Uh, April and I visited. I in, money back in. <laughs> April and I did a trip to Cuba to speak at a, at a small conference. And uh, we went to a, a place called Fusterville, which is, I don't know, an hour and a half drive out of, out of Havana. And it's uh, started by an artist named Fuster. It is now run by his son named Fuster. And basically, he mosaicked first his house and then much of the neighborhood. And, and like you sort of do a tour of this thing. And, and, and when you visit, they ask that you bring some tiles. So I went to local, uh, there's three or four really nice tile places across the Willamette. And they have like a, an, an extras, whatever you call it, um, uh, uh, room. And, and I got some beautiful, beautiful tiles, took them and, you know, I guess they break them and add them in. We didn't, we didn't get to do anything like that. But it was really, um, it was very interesting as a community work of art that started out as one person's manic obsession. Um, Doug, then Wendy. You're muted. I, Wendy, I wanted to um, pick up the thread and and maybe can shift the contextualization a little bit so that the idea of um, the intellectual and the spiritual and those being two different things. And um, part of the part of the shift and transformation in the way of being and orienting and co-creating um, is very much about um, reintegrating and remembering our, you know, our own humanity as human beings, that we're living beings and that we're living beings while we're doing. And those aren't two separate things. And um, they were sort of cleaved apart, going back to, you know, Newton and Descartes and a bunch of other folks. Um, but in fact, we are um, whole beings um, all the time. And Western culture has done everything in its power um, to either kill or beat out of us the human part. And um, the getting arms around 
all of the dimensions of co-creating together, the living dimensions, the emotional dimensions, the energetic dimensions, all of the facets of us while doing um, isn't, it isn't, it isn't complicated, but at the same time, it isn't easy to get to with all of the imprinting and all of the, the, um, all of the uh, imposed belief systems and constraints, traumas and, and, um, and hurts and fears um, of the world we're living in. And um, it is possible, I'm, I'm just gonna sort of state it, but it is possible to deal with all of those facets as part of an integrated, integrative, creative process. The, the shifts required have mostly to do with time, have mostly to do with creating space and slowing down. And when triggers happen, recognizing those as part of integrative two and valuable for the generative endeavor, the creative endeavor, that they're not about a person problem and the train's got to run on time. We don't have time to deal with that. It's if somebody's triggered, first of all, in being triggered, they just left the team because their whole energy turned inward. And that's a hit to the collective generative potential. So having integrated a value which says somebody is triggered for whatever the reason, that's the whole group's responsibility. That's the whole group's um, um, order of priority. And so the, the, that re, reorientation to present moment and what's needed is a constant shift and constantly changing dynamic. And developing the alacrity and the flexibility and the openness to shifting response to those needs as part of a generative flow has to do with that sort of foundational orientation of everybody to that idea. And we actually have a lot of examples of this working, this operating in our reality, in, in present moment reality. Um, it's found in, in some indigenous tribes. You know, the, the Kogis don't have a word for enemy. <laughs> they, they don't have a concept of anybody or anything being separate, being apart, being adverse. Everything and everybody's part of the same whole. We're all connected. All the tropism around that always sort of is unfortunate to me in the invoking of it. But the truth of the matter is it's true. And... Um, it's in the creating separation, creating difference, creating distance, creating alienation that our current reality is, uh, is falling under its own weight. So your share earlier about it's in the way that we're oriented and approach these things that I'm um, sort of speaking to advocating for and um, the the shift in the way of that has to do with um, orientation to the collective purpose in such a way so that um, 
the the group has the openness, sensing, awareness, responsiveness to everything that emerges in real time, moment to moment, whether it's an individual with a trigger or whether it's change of plans folks or whether it's a moving target or whether it's a whole new circumstantial frame that drops on everybody's head. That's the reality that we're living in and nothing's fixed, nothing repeats, nothing recurs. That's reality and our coming to terms with that, um, letting go of our projection that we can control that and shifting into a in response to as part of um, would be certainly us doing us very differently. I'm imagining that there's an alternate reality plane where this same group of people is collected in a Silicon Valley startup, which is about to have an IPO. Just kidding. <laughs> um, Wendy, then Doug, see. I'm in that same space where I feel like there's so much to share. And so I need a minute to figure out what the best next thing is. There's a lovely practice. I'm forgetting who it's from, but before jumping into a conversation or before applying to take a breath. So I love how you talk about, Doug, how you talk about the space and what it feels like and what we're doing together. And um, I think it cannot be overstated. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna state it again about the need for community healing, right? When you bring a community together, if one person's going through something, the typical response to that now is like, oh, this person's dragging us down, you know, like, oh, do we need to deal with this now? And yet that is every time that has happened for me, even if my brain goes there, my heart knows now the pattern of having gone through that process and everyone in the room having learned from the process. And when it's been led by other people, whether I've been workshops or something and went, oh, that's just between those two people over there. But the, the facilitator of the workshop has done a fabulous job of bringing it back into the room so everyone can talk about it. It's so rich. And the best part isn't the resolution to me, although that's fabulous. The best part is the connection we all feel to each other after the resolution whether a person spoke up about the issue or not didn't matter. There's a vibe in the room that now has shifted and creates a, a, a deepening awareness that I can bring my whole self. And if part of that self is hurting, there are people here who will listen and care. So now I'm willing to take more risk. I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to stretch. I'm willing to grow. So much of this doesn't happen in education. So where, you know, we were talking before, right? It's in chat, some people putting like, why doesn't this, why don't we learn these things in education? Because it's uncomfortable, because we need to take risk, because we need to be comfortable with not knowing the answer. Education's not designed that way right now. I have the information, I'm the teacher, you're the student, the information flows one way. Maybe occasionally if I'm advanced, teacher, I'll allow the information to flow the other way, but really you have to get to a right answer, <laughs> right? It's just even the teachers who are well-meaning and actually already get all this stuff. So I tried to create shifts within the educational system. Oh my gosh, it's a tight, I mean, it, I knew it before going in that it was a Titanic, but giving people actual tools that work inside of education and helping them understand how to use it, so hard, so hard. It's such a different way of being. And then the money comes in and the testing comes in and it washes away everything that was just done, right? So it is not an understanding, it is a way of being different. And the system, it's, it's such a systemic kind of shifting, right? So if one, it's like the family dynamic thing. If one person in the family dynamics ever shifts, everyone feels it and goes, whoa, what's that? Even if the shift was for the better, 
right? The whole system needs to also shift or then what you have is you're putting so much weight on one or two or 10 or a hundred people to, to create, to model, to shift for everyone else. They can't hold that up and do their job and have a life. Like it's, it's too much. So the more we can all shift together, and this goes back to the community healing piece, we shift together, then we rise. And I want to bring that in with what Stacy was saying about diversity. I think it's so critical and the sense I get, and the reason why I keep coming to these spaces, even though I'm, I'm often one of the few or only women in the room, is because there is something different happening here. And because there's, an, there's a general acknowledgement in my mind that not everybody has the time or privilege to have these conversations. So that's already self-selective. And I'm not judgy about any of that accept that we're missing out. It's more an awareness, right? It's not a judgy accept thing. It's more of awareness that we're missing out on a lot of potential learning for ourselves because these people are not in the room. My theory on why they're not in the room and why I don't enter rooms sometimes, which is informing that theory, is because there's not enough listening. I'm just going to boil it down to like it's bare. There's not enough pause there's not enough listening. So that if the energy needs to shift, like Stacy was pointing out before, if I'm going to contribute something that's shifting the energy, I, if I'm a co conscientious, mindful person, I'm going to do that mindfully. I'm not just going to toss something in the room that makes everybody go, whoa, like that, where did that come from? Cause that's not, that's just, that seems like trying to have power over the conversation. I want the conversation to go here now is the way it feels to me, even if that's not the way it's perceived by other people. So I'm trying to, as I was saying before, if conversation is going in a particular direction, even if it's not a direction I would choose, I'm trying to add to it, not subvert it into a conversation that I want to have about something else. Now, sometimes that's valuable, right? If I think the conversation is going in a completely wrong direction or I completely disagree, I'm not saying I'm holding back. I'm saying I'm trying to help the room grow together. That's what I'm trying to do. And that can be best done by adding little pieces onto what's already been offered, not offering up a like another complete, right? So I'm waiting for a shit for a moment to go, ah, this is the right next thing to say. Yes, I want to say it here. So shifting it in that way. And it's not always the right time and entire conversations can go. And I think we've all had this where well, I didn't say that thing, but that's okay. But if that happens over and over and over and over again, those voices never, never enter the room. So unless we all learn to pause and listen more, there will be less opportunity for those shifts. And I think when the door is open, those people, it's not that they don't feel welcome, like our hearts aren't open. It's that there's no space for what they want to talk about, if that, if that helps discern it a bit yeah thank you wendy it does doug c well a difficult conversation in many ways i find that in the words integrative and generative a certain pressure towards conformity uh, i like being in groups where being an outlier is totally okay and i can either be one or live with others who are uh, I think it's really important. We're not going to go forward with everybody in agreement as to what we're doing, but they can acquiesce to a group wisdom that it's okay to move in that direction. End of thought. Can I just reply to that for a sec? Please. Okay, I think that's such, a, such an important contribution. So let me see if I can repeat it back because I'm barely holding on to it, because I feel like these are two slightly different, holding on to two slightly different approaches. And so what you were just saying is you would, you appreciate being, being able to come into spaces where you can, you know, you can really be yourself and you can contribute whatever needs to be contributed. Even if that is a topic that may be, may, may be, um, it's pushing people, stretching people. Did I hear that right? <laughs> so I would not use the word self. Uh, okay. I think it, it, 
appears to be fun foundational and it's actually a problem. Uh, I'm more in the Buddhist sense that uh, consciousness is like an onion and you peel it down to the point where there's nothing left. So I think what I want to be saying is it's okay to have, not only is it okay, but it's essential to have differences remain in the group conversation because we don't know what kind of fire and friction we might need next. Mm -hmm. And to narrow it down to a shared integrative view just feels to me oppressive. Yes. All right. So you're saying allowing for the diversity in the room is super important that not trying to always find like, like the end goal isn't consensus. The end goal is appreciating all the perspectives. Is that a good way yeah, to say And it? notice the difference between allow and appreciate. Uh, I want to go to the appreciation of difference. Uh, the fact that we don't think the same is really critical for the, my own development and for, for yours. Uh, and allow has a kind of parental mm. supervision quality to it. Mm-hmm. Like I'm giving you permission to put your perspective in. I'm allowing it. I'm the one. Yeah, I'll shut up for a minute while you say what you have to say, and then I'll go back to what I was saying. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. I, I appreciate the clarification. Um, I think the, a nuance I would like to add here is that for people that are used to, and I'm one of these people who in certain spaces, I'm in control of creating the environment in the room. And so for people who are used to or have had experience creating those spaces, um, I know I'm not shy about speaking up. What I'm trying to allow space for is the person that might be a little more shy about sharing, right? That, that the, the assumption that if we create welcoming space that those people will share, I think is not fully codify yeah i don't know how to say that it's not it's not fully true i think that's a beginning point but i don't think that's the ending point to allowing all the perspectives to be shared and when i try i play a little mental game with myself you know if there was an if there's an opportunity to go say be a lone person in a community that i'm not used to being a part of would i go and would i sit and just listen and if the answer is no then why are we expecting other people to do that in our spaces who feel like they're not this is not their usual space to be in. Why, why would they? So I play that game. What would make me feel welcome to go to another space that is a, a community or a culture or an event or something that, that isn't typically the groups that I go to? And what would make me feel welcome walking into that space? Let me give an example from something that's just happened in the last couple of days. As many of you know, I work with the Institute for New Economic Thinking as a kind of strategy consultant. And my drive for the last year has been to try and create a conversation where economists talk seriously about climate change. And it's been very hard because they can't put it in differential equations so it doesn't exist. (laughs) Uh, So we created a group to try and talk about this. And it was people really with all the stuff that you guys know, the tension when people really disagree and don't know how to voice that disagreement. So we used a method which was we meet once a week. We start the meeting. Uh, there are about 10 people uh, going. The, the idea is to go around the circle and each person say what's been on their mind about climate change in the last week that they think is most worthy of a conversation. Who would like to go first? Somebody volunteers, they say. They then pass the talking stick, which is virtual because we're in Zoom, to somebody else, and they go. By the time you've gone around the room, you have a lot of new differences. And what's really, and what's happened in the group is shifting to an appreciation and a kind of love of being in the group as people have been able to talk about their difficult perceptions without any pressure to bring them into a consensus. Uh, And the the shift in the group has been quite remarkable, and it's allowed us now to move on to a a new level of discussion about what's going on. And letting people say first what's been on their mind means what's been on their mind before they've joined the group and feel the group pressure. 
And hearing each person then, everybody in the group has heard themselves in the group, which is always a barrier. If people don't get to hear their own voice, they don't really feel like they're there yet. So it was just a way, uh, uh, very fruitful way of handling differences. And it turned out to be extremely uh, uh, fruitful. Mm -hmm. um, Mark, thank you for reminding me of a facilitator's tool or technique. Um, it's a, uh, we're a little close to the end of our call, but it's a good moment to say everybody who's been participating in the conversation, please step back for a second. And anybody who hasn't had any airtime, please feel free to jump in. I've been active in the chat, but I've so far only spoken once. So I'm going to grab the mic. Um, Steve, El Microfono. I think um, something that, in, in looking back, I, I got involved. I, I still remember the day I read the Yatni Reader um, uh, article on dialogue in 1989 about David Bohm and Krishnamurti. And I was like, oh, this sounds really cool. Um, and I've been dabbling in that for over 30 years now. And I recognize my own progress and and growth and the practice you know we we have we need shared practices i have been sharing in the practice of dialogue now for a very long time and so i have some skill with it um someone who's never had that you know they're they can show up here and they're going to be like whoa i don't know how to even be in this group um and they may be they might hide out or they might you know say things that embarrass themselves i'm also very aware that for this particular group there have been a lot of people, myself included, I'm, I no longer have this anymore, but when I first got here, I was like, holy shit, there's all these wicked smart people here, and do I have a right to be here? And, you know, I've heard several people say they're intimidated by the level of intellect in this in this collective room. So I think we need to be really aware of that. Um, and, um, you know, if we're going to um, become a more diverse group, it is incumbent upon each of us to reach out and talk to other people and say, you know, I really think you could be a, a great asset, a, a great addition to this group. Uh, would love to hear your voice come in. Just come in and, and listen a few times. Um, so what are we doing and not doing that is in the way of, um, of bringing in more diversity, age diversity, gender diversity, um, whatever diversity you, you care to put on it so that's on us you know i, I love everybody here I, I have benefited so much from um listening to you all and being in conversation with you all and i would really like to see us um make more efforts um i actually i think i was the one who invited claudia maybe mark also invited her at the same time but i did invite her and um I've invited a few other people and they show up and they, and they leave. So there's another thing, you know, why are we need an exit view? Why do people come for a couple of times and not show up? Um, if we want to get serious about, about that, those are some ideas that. You could just up. prohibit people from leaving. That easy. There's, there's that, you know, we, can you, can you actually chain someone on zoom, right? Manacles, uh, just Marcus, Marcus doing the, <laughs> universal, the universal gesture for manacle. Yeah. But don't we need woman, woman calls or something? Um, oh, anyway. point. no, no, no. There's a reason they're called manacles. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> okay and it, that's, and it rhymes, that's my and it rhymes with that other manly thing <laughs> um klaus then michael then gil yeah I'm, I'm really struggling with this conversation uh trying to to connect you know and uh i think duck just helped me uh, with uh, referencing his experience with the discussion group that that he has um, I mean, it doesn't really matter how well educated and how smart we are, you know, we are uh, all struggling with our emotional context, you know, our life experiences and, and emotions and, and uh, fears, anxieties and hopes and what have you. Um, I, I think my, my, uh, my focus has been on translating what we are discussing at one level to, to making it practical in, in other ways to help people who are stuck in whatever ways because of the, um, the information world they're embedded in and, and the, the uh, 
uh, prejudices and, and uh, opinions and so on and, and change the conversation in ways that some may consider manipulative, but in other ways, it's really finding an entryway, you know, into, into uh, what is acceptable in, in form of information, in form of uh, a different perspective on reality. So, I mean, one practical example that we're just starting into climate change is is like uh, a no go zone when you are talking in political circles right it has been completely destroyed as uh, as a consensus building topic so me working in in agriculture food and agriculture if you shift your focus to water and I just posted some some items uh, in this regard if you shift your focus to water um, I was in a meeting with the American Sustainable Business Network, and I'm on their uh, advisory group for uh, the farm bill discussion. Um, and we decided, that, and, and somebody made a presentation saying that 98% of the American public is concerned about water. Now, whether that's whether you live on the beach in Florida uh, and and you get uh, you, you have you know the the beach full of dead fish and you can't get into the water because it's contaminated, or whether you live along Lake Erie, or whether you live in a in a city in California and your water wells dry up because the farmers are sucking it down the the aquifers you know below input wells, um, water is an emotional connection for everyone. And so if we start explain the deep dive into what is happening to our water and why is it uh, 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 so problematic, you can, you can connect with people and you surround, you circumvent the entire debate you know, that has been laid out to, to basically uh, defend against any kind of activity on climate change. And the reason I'm saying that is um, that the, 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 the way we understand things, the way we inform each other is really, we're really in the matrix here. Uh, and the, this is an active uh, uh, engagement. This is not serendipitous. Now, there are people who are really laying in information for, for reasons, because uh, the public is being guided and manipulated in what we call consensus building or consensus opinions uh, in ways that we don't even really notice. I mean, even very smart people, very well-educated people don't notice you know, how the information is structured in ways that guides your opinions. So, so then you have to counterweil this. And, so, so, and, and this is really where, where you have to Get into this into this matrix and say and, and, and think in ways that can help people. Uh, and, and, and I was in a meeting where uh, uh, Bateson was speaking, and she was just aghast at my opinion that we need to counter manipulate, right? Because she just thought that was that was uh, an, an, a horrible idea. But then I'm thinking, if you're in a war, you know. <laughs> it's, and we are in an information war, then uh, how do you defend and how do you, how do you push and, and manipulate uh, in, in ways that are constructive, right? So anyway, I'll I, I leave it at that. I mean, we're all, we're all painfully um, uh, winding our way into uh, to, uh, trying to understand reality, dealing with it, trying to figure out how we can intervene in ways that are constructive and positive and, uh, and not get overwhelmed by, by all of the hopelessness that you see when you, when you look at, uh, at our reality and just, uh, my way of coping is just to be active, you know, it's just fight and, and, and I look at it as a fight, really. Thanks, Klaus. Um, Michael Van Gill. Hi, all. Um, it's a great conversation. Um, at, uh, at the risk of repeating something I've said before, um, just with regard to diversity in this group, um, I think one of the most productive things I found um, is to 
make to be present at in other groups um, where each of us all any of us would be in the minority in some way and and listen and participate and establish connection and trust um, and it's it's still going to be hard for any one person at a time to join this very homogeneous group. Um, and we might want to think um, about ways that we as a group can join with another group, um, either in the way of inviting, you know, having the deference and respect for um, another group to invite that group to, to speak to us and for us to listen and question um, as opposed to inviting individuals to come and be at the periphery, you know, first listening to us. Um, so, I mean, shifting the dynamic, I don't think is going to come so easily from the one-off invitation. Um, yeah, I, I mean, that, that's the gist of my point. And I think, it's, I think it's very possible, and it might be one of those format things where, just like we're now switching between the check-in meeting and the subject meeting, um, that maybe a third meeting is the, you know, shut up and listen to someone else meeting and then have the Q and A um, so that, that people can, that have, are different than us, are younger than us, are you know, more of color than us, are more you know, women dominated than us, are not from the North, North, um, North America, um, can, can come in as the, the centerpiece um, and, and hear from us as respectful you know, questioners. So yeah. Thanks, Michael. Um, a, a perennial problem for us, and I think that's a good approach. Um, and if any of us have any ideas on which communities to invite in, that would be a great thing to, to share in. We can figure that out. Um, Gil, you may have the last word here today, uh, although I'll pass the mic back to Doug after you. Okay, a few words. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I, I don't come to this group with any purpose or certainly not with any project. Um, I come here because thinking seems to happen sometimes, or at least new thoughts show up in me um, as some kind of outcome of these conversations. So I'm grateful for that. Um, I, I and, and I, I've been active in the chat, but a couple of words here. Uh, um, as as my teacher Ken Homer uh, tells me, uh, uh, humans fall into this blurring of the we very often. We use a we in many different contexts and layers um, uh, throughout our lives, but even in the same conversation, and it gets a little sloppy. And I think that's something we might want to attend to a bit. Um, you know, to the to the conversation about training a while ago, it's really it's fascinating that we expect training for all sorts of things. I mean, if you're going to be a doctor, or an airline pilot, or an opera singer, or all sorts of things, you you train to do that. But we think that you don't train to be a human; you just are who you are, and that's the more, more authentic thing is to be whatever comes out of you without preparing yourself uh, for how you want to live and how you want to be. And I think there's a really interesting conversation to have there. Um, even without explicit training, we have training by acculturation. And that's, you know, that's been a theme throughout the conversation here. Somebody talked about Western civilization, you know, doggedly pursuing whatever agenda. Um, and it's not an actor. There's not a thing with a mind and an intention that does that. And yet, you know, here we are, all of us, the effect of that. Um, um, I wonder whether our own acculturation here is a barrier to the diversity that we all seem to seek. Um, it's not just that we all have classes and we're all of a similar hue, uh, but we have similar orientation, similar concerns, uh, and the kinds of things that we are 
seeking from a conversation may not be very attractive to a lot of other people. I don't know if that's good or bad, um, but uh, I can imagine inviting people who would come here and look around and say, no, thanks, not for me. Um, and um, so, you know, can a commitment to diversity be a barrier to diversity? Um, I very much like Michael's idea of consciously putting ourselves in situations where we are the minority. Uh, that's happened to me in my life very rarely, and it's been striking when I when I realized it, and uh, really uh, eye opening and heart opening. So I, I appreciate that conversation. And, and last thing, has anyone come across bias declarations? Um, a, a progressive, socially mindful PR firm that I know is now putting bias declarations on all their work. And it strikes me as a profoundly weird thing to say, hey, we have biases, which is sort of tautological, obvious, like, don't we all? It doesn't say we are dealing with our biases in these ways, which is which I've seen on some academic bias declarations. Um, but anyway, just an example of the of of the potential weirdness of where our commitments take us. I was on a call a couple of days ago with Joanna Macy and Jonathan somebody, Galvin, weird name. Um, you know, Gustin. Kind of, hmm? say, say again. Jonathan Gustin. Gustin, yes, thank you, Ken. Um, which was uh, you know a, an opportunity to enter the grief work around climate. Um, and um, I, I personally found it very strange. I think uh, attractive to certain people, very much not attractive to certain people. And for me, part of the strangeness was a profoundly ungrounded conversation about the science of climate. And when I questioned it, um, I, when I asked for a source of uh, uh, um, documenting one of the statements that was made, somebody said, well, you know in your heart what's going on to, to me directly. And I thought, how fascinating. Like, you know, if, what, if, what if what's in my heart is different than what's in your heart? You know, and what if my, what if our hearts have different sensibilities about what the temperature is uh, in the world? So anyhow, so I'm, I, this is not the note I wanted to end on, but I'm, I'm, I'm in a bit of frustration at the, the acculturation that's happening among our ilk and how powerful it is and how inviting it is for the kind of diversity and richness of conversation that we're seeking. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Gil. And I'm very uh, grateful to all of you. Yeah, thank you. Same here. Much to think about from this call. Um, Doug, what, if anything, would you like to leave us with? In particular, if I can sharpen the question, what short advice would you give us for how to keep improving what we're trying, what we think we're doing? I don't know about advice. Like I'm not, I'm not constitutionally oriented that way. Um, but I am hugely grateful and appreciative of um, the degree to which everybody stayed in the water. Like, you know, um, and uh, that's sort of uh, an example model, like experiential frame of what it's like to start in zero and feel sense into present moment and um, and provide the space for everything that showed up. And, and there was a massive amount that showed up. And, um, and um, it's just very rich and hugely appreciative uh, for me uh, to have, uh, have that happen. Um. Thank you. Um, who was jumping in? I thought I heard a voice. Stacey, were you, were you going to jump in? No, I'm just reading. I'm just, I'm, I was laughing. I'm just, no, sorry. Catching up on the chat now that we've got bias statements in the chat. Um, 
Cool. Uh, thank you. This has been really rich. I just pasted uh, my notes so far in my brain from this call. If you want to follow it, and I just synchronize, so you'll get everything I just put in. Um, super rich and interesting. So um, copying some of the bias statement links, and we are off. Um, let's leave with just a moment of silence and uh, drop off as you wish to. I will leave. When I leave, I will leave the room open. So if somebody wanted to stay the rest of the day and stay in silence, that would be fine. But let's go into silence and just drop off when you are so moved. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'll go. I'll see you at four, Jerry. I got to run. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Great call. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks, Ken. <laughs>